I'm pleased to tell you that I finally finished building my fusion reactor. Today I'm going to give an overview of the setup and then show a run of it working in producing neutrons. There are many different fusion reactions, but the one that this fusion reactor uses is the fusion of deuterium nuclei. As you can see from the diagram, one of these pathways produces helium-3 and a neutron. This neutron is what we can detect and prove that fusion is actually happening. To fuse the deuterium nuclei, they have to be accelerated to very high speeds and collided into each other. This is done with a voltage potential of over 15,000 volts. However, during this acceleration, we can't have the deuterium nuclei bumping into anything else, so this reaction has to be carried out under vacuum. In order to feed the high voltage into the vacuum chamber, I'm using this 30,000 volt feed-through. I've insulated the stainless steel rod from the feed-through with an alumina tube. On the end, you can see a configuration of tungsten rings. This is called the inner grid. The high voltage power supply is configured to be negative hot, so this tungsten inner grid is negatively charged. Since the entire vacuum chamber that I'm using is made out of stainless steel, the potential is simply placed between this inner grid and the outer shell. The outer shell is connected to earth ground. Since the inner grid is negatively charged, the positively charged deuterium nuclei are accelerated towards the center, where they collide and fuse. The high voltage is supplied by a large AC flyback. This flyback is powered by a ZVS driver. The output of the flyback is fed into a high voltage tripler. The tripler produces 0 to 35,000 volts DC at up to 5 milliamps of current, which is more than enough power to do detectable fusion. You'll also notice a 400 mega ohm high voltage resistor chain. This is connected to the output of the voltage multiplier. This resistor chain is then fed into a 100 microamp meter. The microamp meter is then used to measure how much high voltage is being applied to the system. 0 to 100 microamps indicates 0 to 40,000 volts. To establish a fusion reaction, we need a deuterium pressure in the vacuum chamber of about 10 to 30 microns. But before we can feed the deuterium into the chamber, we first need to evacuate it to a far lower pressure. This is done with a combination of a roughing pump and a high vacuum oil diffusion pump. The roughing pump that I'm using is an Edwards E2M2 that was being thrown out of the engineering department at the university that I attend. After replacing just a couple parts on it, it's working just fine. Once the roughing pump has established a pressure below 30 microns in the chamber, we can then turn on the oil diffusion pump. The diffusion pump that I'm using is an Edwards Diffstack 63. A diffusion pump boils a special type of oil. The oil vapor is then directed through a series of jets, where it traps gas molecules from the chamber. These gas molecules are then pulled out by the roughing pump which creates a very deep vacuum in the chamber. The deuterium gas line is pretty simple. I use a syringe to store the deuterium gas and then a combination of a shutoff valve and a metering valve to regulate the flow of deuterium into the chamber. The gas line itself is quarter inch copper tube. Pressure measurement for the main chamber is accomplished with a baritron. I built a little power supply unit that powers the baritron and I use a harbor freight voltmeter to measure the output. Now that I've described the components of the fusor, it's time for a fusion run. The first step is to turn on the roughing pump. Next, I open the valve leading to the diffusion pump, and then open the shutoff valve on the diffusion pump itself. Once the chamber pressure is below 30 microns, I can plug in the diffusion pump and turn on the cooling system. Since the diffusion pump is boiling oil, it has to condense this oil. It condenses the oil with a water cooling line. My cooling system is just a bucket of water with an aquarium pump. The water from the diffusion pump is fed through a heat exchanger to ensure that it stays cool. After the diffusion pump has been running for about an hour, the chamber has been evacuated to a pressure far below 1 micron, and we're ready to start feeding in deuterium. For my fusor, I've decided to generate my own deuterium. I do this using a small PEM cell and heavy water. By applying 3 volts at about 1 amp to the PEM cell, we generate deuterium and oxygen from the heavy water. We don't need the oxygen, however, so this just vents to the atmosphere and the deuterium is collected in the syringe. To detect the fast neutrons produced by the fusor, I've decided to go with the foolproof method of using a bubble dosimeter. A bubble dosimeter consists of a superheated fluid suspended in a gel. When it's exposed to neutron radiation, it produces bubbles inside. Shown here is a picture of the dosimeter before being exposed to neutrons. You'll notice a bunch of fine bubbles suspended throughout the entire tube. These are completely normal and do not indicate the presence of neutron radiation. The true bubbles formed by this detector are much larger, and we'll see those later. By unscrewing the piston, turning it around, and screwing it back in, the detector is now primed and ready to detect neutrons. I used a ring stand to place the detector close to the shell of the chamber. Although I do have this viewport on the chamber, it's not a good idea to look into it while the fusor is running. The fusor doesn't just produce neutrons, it's also going to produce tons of x-rays. 
The stainless steel chamber will do a good job of blocking most of these x-rays at the voltage range that I'm working at. However, this viewport is going to be a major source of radiation. So I've rigged up a Raspberry Pi with a cheap camera module, and after a little bit of programming, I've got it set up to where I can preview, record, and take pictures. So I've now attached the full syringe of deuterium to the gas line. What comes next is a balancing act between input voltage, input current, and chamber pressure. If the deuterium pressure is too high in the chamber, the current skyrockets and I can't get enough voltage to produce a fusion reaction. Conversely, if the deuterium pressure is too low, the current goes way down and I can't get enough power to produce detectable fusion. For my setup, I found that the optimum deuterium pressure is around 15 microns. This gives me voltages in the 25 to 30,000 volt range and currents from 2.5 to 5 milliamps. The video that you're seeing now comes from the Raspberry Pi camera module. The white dots appearing all over the screen are hot pixels from x-rays. The reddish pink plasma is characteristic of deuterium. As I mentioned before, the viewport is a major source of x-ray radiation. Let's see what happens when I hold a Geiger counter up to it while the fusor is running. The Geiger counter is easily saturated by the x-rays pouring out of the window. After an 8 minute run, I decided to retrieve the bubble dosimeter and see if neutrons had been detected. Some large bubbles are clearly visible in the tube. These bubbles definitively prove that nuclear fusion occurred and fast neutrons were produced. When the piston on the dosimeter is screwed back in, the gel is compressed and the bubbles disappear. This dosimeter is ready for the next nuclear fusion run. Now the question is what to do with the few milliliters of leftover deuterium. I hope you've enjoyed this video of my homemade fusion reactor. If you've been following my channel for a long time now, you'll know that I've been working on this project for many, many years. It's very exciting for me to see it finally come to fruition. I couldn't have built this Fusor without the knowledge and wisdom of those on the Fusor.net forum. I've documented my setup in much greater detail in a post there, so if you're interested, I'll have a link in the description to the forum where you can find more information on my setup. Thanks for watching.